In this episode, geography professor Dr. Tom Johnson explores the geography of circumstance, drawing on examples ranging in scale from the neighborhood to the nation state, from the micro scale to the macro, Dr. Johnson explores the manner in which geographic location, both in absolute and relative terms, plays a role in shaping futures and helps us explain the present and the past. Just as every population cohort is presented with different sets of circumstances, every geographic location has associated with it constraints and opportunities that are specific to time and place. Well, it's uh, indeed a, an honor uh, and a privilege to be speaking to you uh, tonight. When I started thinking about what I might say, I looked over the roster of previous uh, speakers and I even watched a few of the videos. Um, and I can tell you that the colleagues of mine who have taken part in this uh, series has set a very high bar. Uh, I hope that uh, I can meet those standards tonight. So the title of my talk, as you can see, is The Geography of Circumstance. Pictured in this uh, image is Michael Palin uh, of Monty, uh, uh, Monty Python fame, yes. He, I understand, read history at, you know, one of those Oxbridge universities. And, uh, and then he got smart and uh, became a geographer. He served two terms as the president of the Royal Geographical Society. And a few years ago, he received the gold medal from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Now, you might have read the article in the Herald yesterday. Uh, and if you're here to, to listen to me talk about... Uh, wildfire in uh, Waterton, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you. That was a, a mix up and I'm not sure quite how it happened. I won't be offended if you leave. Uh, but if you have any questions, we can perhaps deal with that in the question period. So the, the central point of my talk is, is that place and, or in everyday terminology, location matters. This idea that place matters is captured in, in this book, which is written by Harm de Bly, a, quite a well-known American geographer. The central argument in the book is that it's not just place, but rather the geographic circumstances embedded in place that matter. He also makes the point in this book that for many people, the significance of place is not particularly well understood despite the fact that it's perhaps one of the most important uh, influencing uh, influences uh, in our daily lives. Now, I'd like to start by talking about what I mean by, by circumstance in general terms. And then I will uh, talk about what I mean by geographic circumstances and then get on with some examples. So if we are to believe the Oxford uh, English Language Dictionary, a circumstance is a fact or condition connected with or relevant to, folks at Oxford like their commas, don't they, uh, and the subordinate clauses, uh, uh, can, relevant to uh, an event, an action, or some other uh, outcome. So I want to uh, give an, a, a, a brief description or, or an example before I go on to talk about the, the geography here. And what I want to talk about uh, by way of an example is something called the cohort effect. Uh, this is quite appropriate for the University of Lethbridge since one of the members of our psychology department, Roger Barnsley, contributed to this literature many, many years ago. So what the cohort effect holds, or posits, that's a fancy academic word, is that individuals uh, born at a particular point in time, or a span of time, uh, share a set of common age-related experiences, and that those experiences can then be seen later in life in terms of various decisions and values and attitudes. So I'll give you an example. My parents were both born at the beginning of the Great Depression, my father in 1930 and my mother a year earlier in 1929. So even as a child, I saw the ways in which that experience of the Great Depression influenced uh, their lives and their everyday decisions and indeed many of those uh, of their friends. My parents always maintained a kitchen garden, as we used to call it from the farm, 
uh, because you never know when food might be scarce in, in the grocery stores. Uh, they were adverse to debt. I remember it was almost like the second coming when the first credit card entered the, uh, entered the house. Uh, they didn't trust the stock market. If you'd lived through that period and saw uh, your, your, your father and your grandparents uh, lose money, you might not uh, trust the stock market either. And they weren't alone. Now, of course, not all individuals will respond in the same way to their cohort's age exper uh, experiences. And that's, in fact, why some of the problems that we deal with in the social sciences are actually incredibly messy because we're dealing with folks. They're not quite, uh, and they don't conform to, you know, the laws of physics, for example. So I want to explain this uh, idea a little bit more with respect to these three gentlemen. So we have Bill Gates on the, on the left, and we have uh, uh, Paul Allen on the right, and we have Stephen Jobs, the guy who convinces you to buy stuff that you don't really need, in the middle. They were all born uh, within about five years of each other, between 1950 and 1955, and that's really important. Now, one year before Microsoft was uh, formed, and two years before Apple was formed, a uh, corporation called the Intel Corporation uh, released a fancy new microprocessor, the 8080. Among the other advantages, it held many advantages, including the increased memory that was a critical step forward in uh, the development of the personal computer. So Gates, Allen, and Jobs uh, were perfectly positioned at the particular point in their lives to take advantage of this new technology. All three men in their respective companies were, by circumstance, at the right place at the right time. Now, had they been born 20 years earlier or had they been born 20 years later, they might have been incredibly successful because they were pretty driven, driven people. But we might not know their names today. They might not be quite as, as well known. So now I want to, with that as a brief introduction, I would like to want to... My mother just rolled in her grave. Um, I'd like to go on and talk about uh, the concept, two fundamental concepts in geography, site and situation. So when, when geographers talk about uh, site, what we're talking about are the, are the particulars of a given location. So we might talk about the site characteristics of, of Lethbridge. Uh, in terms of the, long la the longitude and latitude, or long lat in geography language. Um, 49 degrees, 63 minutes north, and 112 degrees, 8 minutes west of the prime meridian. We might also talk in terms of uh, physical attributes. So what the climate is like here, what the soil is, is like here, uh, how, much, how much precipitation we get, and so on. And we might also talk in terms of the economic activity. So the map on the left shows the site of Winnipeg. It lies at the confluence of two major rivers, the Assiniboine that comes in from the west and the, and the Red River that comes in from, from the south. No other city in Canada lies at the confluence of those two rivers. So they are absolute conditions that cannot be changed. Now the map on the right shows Winnipeg's relative location. And we might describe Winnipeg's relative location with respect to the 49th parallel, uh, or the fact that it's about 2,200 kilometers uh, either way to Vancouver or Montreal. Uh, each one of those are examples of Winnipeg's relative location. And so taken together, these two fundamental geographic concepts, uh, the site and situational characteristics, exert incredible influence over the trajectory of, uh, of a given geographic phenomenon, such as a region or a population in a region. So that brings me to then the meat of what I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to, uh, just to talk about the geography of circumstance with respect to three examples. Two examples are historical. Uh, one of the courses I teach, the geography of Canada, uh, cannot be taught uh, in the absence of a historical perspective. Uh, Janae's nodding her head, I see. Um, as uh, present circumstances are historically contingent. And any kind of comprehensive understanding of the present demands a historical perspective. So the first involves the transformation 
of Atlantic Canada from, and this will surprise a lot of people perhaps, from a region that was once an economic powerhouse to a region that is now a slow growing region, a have not region, a lagging region. And we're going to talk about some of the geography behind that. The second, um, the second example uh, I call unequal beginnings, and this is a, I stole this. Most geographers steal the good ideas, um, any good idea we see. Uh, this comes from a, a book written by John McCollum. Some of you may recognize that name. Uh, and this deals with the differential uh, economic growth in Quebec and Ontario between 1800 and about 1900. And the third is a more contemporary example, and that's the geography of uh, food insecurity. Not food security, but food insecurity. Okay, on we go. So, just in case you didn't know, there we have Atlantic Canada on the, um, on the um, right side of the map. We have, of course, been British Columbia, the left coast, so to speak, on the other side. Uh, Atlantic Canada comprises uh, four provinces, the three maritime provinces, which was the term, the terminology that was used before, uh, before Newfoundland entered Confederation in 1949. So we have Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, and, no and Newfoundland, and, and, and Labrador. Now, uh, sorry, did I just yell? <laughs> sorry. I, uh, I have hearing loss, and I have hearing aids, and so... It's the, f it's the feedback is, I'm not, yeah, anyway, there are people in the audience who appreciate this. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what we have here is, uh, we geographers, we like tables, eh? And we like data. I mean, I, as a geography student in high school back uh, in a province east of here, as I tell my students, the ones that, are, you know, suffer from Western alienation, uh, we, we, we would be given a table of data and then the task would be to describe what's going on in the data. So we can make pictures in our heads and write those pictures down. And that's a really important geographic skill. So here we have population uh, uh, numbers for Atlantic Canada. I've thrown in Western, the Western Canadian provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta for comparison and then for Canada as a whole. Uh, as you can see, between 1996 and 2016, the rate of change in Atlantic Canada was less than 5%. By contrast, the Canadian population grew by 25%. And here in the West, this happens to correspond with a period of pretty remarkable growth here in Western Canada, and particularly in, uh, in Alberta, um, uh, 43, well, 44% when you round it. Uh, now, here are some other data. This is net migration estimates. And this is for a 10-year period starting in 1851 through 1861 and ending up in 1921 and 1931. Now, just after uh, Confederation were not great times for Canada. There were a series of, um, well, there was the, a, a couple of political scandals, not that those ever happened in Canada, <laughs> and um, uh, a couple of depressions, not that those have ever happened either. But you can see that for until 1900, so 1900 is the green line, more people left Canada than arrived. That's something that a lot of people don't, don't know. That surprises my students, I know. Well, anything surprises students. Because <laughs> they don't know anything. They're, they're not only geographically illiterate, but they're historically illiterate as well, mainly. Um, uh, our population did grow, and that was because we had uh, astronomically high uh, a birth rate at the time. But after 1900, which corresponds with the European agricultural settlement of the West, uh, sometimes referred to as colonization or invasion by Europeans, we have, uh, we're in a net, net, uh, positive net situation. But you can see Atlantic Canada never rebounds. Atlantic Canada continues on that slow rate of decline. Uh, if we're at all familiar with the news, we know that Atlantic Canada is a region of chronic unemployment. Here we have unemployment data for Atlantic Canada generally on the far right uh, and the four provinces. Uh, and for Canada, this is for 2015. These data are not unique. This, I know this is one snapshot in time, but this is not a unique situation. Now, 
there are obviously some bright spots. Um, Halifax, the region's largest uh, city, and an incredibly cosmopolitan city because of its port location, uh, is it still a major shipbuilding center. Uh, the shellfish industry has taken up some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, pain from the closure of the uh, northern cod fishery, which happened in 1992 and continues uh, to this day. And the discovery uh, of offshore oil has, um, has meant that uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador are now amongst the uh, Canada's uh, oil-producing uh, provinces, of course, notwithstanding the downturn, of course. But the period, I, I love maps, I love historical maps. Most of the maps that you'll see here come from the uh, materials that come with the uh, textbook that I use in my Geography of Canada course. Um, the period between about the mid-18th century and the mid-19th century was one of economic prosperity in Atlantic Canada. That prosperity was based primarily on the region's natural resources, uh, uh, cod and timber, and also the region's position within the economic machinery of the British Empire. The availability of uh, timber, the region's maritime location, and the demand from <coughs> Great Britain, the world's leading naval power at the time, all combined or conspired, if you will, to produce the ideal conditions for shipbuilding. And by the 1840s, uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick were amongst the leading shipbuilding centers in the British Empire. And as European colonization of British North America uh, started to push past Quebec and into Ontario, starting in the late 1700s and into the early 1800s, Halifax, which is shown here, and, and St. John on the Bay of Fundy, uh, performed a really important gateway city function. So they were linchpins, if you will, like the linchpin on the back of a tractor, connecting uh, Europe and, and Great Britain with, with, the rest of, uh, with the rest of Canada. Now, to put this in context, uh, Winnipeg performed the same function during the agricultural settlement of Western Canada, starting late, late, uh, late 1800s and picking up in early 1900s. And Edmonton today performs the same gateway function with respect to the Western Arctic and, 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 and Northern Alberta. However, the uh, good times didn't last. Despite an optimistic set of beginnings, the Atlantic, Atlantic Canada ultimately could not complete its industrial transformation. And uh, from about the mid 1850s on, it lagged behind the rest of the country in terms of economic growth, population growth, and just about any other measure that you'd want, uh, that you'd want to um, uh, mention. So here we have uh, data on population. You can see in 1871, Atlantic Canada accounted for just over 20% of the Canadian population. By the 2011 census, when these numbers were taken, that figure was down to 7%. And as of the 2016 census, it was down even further to 6.5%. So it's a, it's a region that is on the downward slide. Now, how do we explain this? Um, geographers ask, you know, what is where and why is it there? So why, is it, why did this happen? If we subscribe to the conventional wisdom, the answer lies in various deficits inherent in the in the essential character of Atlantic Canadians. Let me repeat that. If we subscribe to the conventional wisdom, the answer lies in various deficits inherent in the character of, of Atlantic Canadians. And if you're having trouble believing me, think about the ideas that are embedded in uh, artifacts of, of popular culture, such as the ubiquitous Newfie joke that we all uh, laughed at when we were, t when we were children. It, it's a narrative that views Atlantic Canadians as less capable, less intelligent, less industrious, as compared with other, other Canadians. This narrative even found its way into an explanation that was offered in May 2002 by Stephen Harper, when he was a uh, leader of the official opposition. It's also 
satirized by this hour is 22 minutes, one of the, next to Hockey Night in Canada, one of the best television shows on Canadian television. Whether it's The Real Housewives of, of Town or whether it's Mary Walsh's uh, incredibly uh, funny character, Dakey Dunn, who is referred to as the 22 minute masculinity correspondent. Uh, I, I, I looked at some YouTube videos and I just couldn't show it to a mixed audience. <laughs> Um, I'm very sorry about that, actually. Um, it's really, they're satirizing, uh, back to us in many ways, that popular narrative that exists in such things as a Newfie joke and in the comments by some political leaders. But the thesis that I want to, <laughs> as for the historians, the thesis that I want to present is that the answer does not lie in subjective narratives deeply embedded in public consciousness and popular culture, but rather in other factors, many of which are clearly geographical in nature. One such explanation was offered by Professor Graham Wynne, a historical geographer from the University of British Columbia. And this is a quote from a paper that Professor Wynne wrote. I'll, I'll read it. The region was reasonably endowed with resources essential to the age of wood, wind, and water, and it possessed vital advantages in the early stages of the epoch, good geological term, of coal, iron, and steel, and steam, I'm sorry. He goes on to add, by the 1950s, the region was relegated to the economic margin, owing to a declining set of resource endowments, which continued with the cod closure. Um, Atlantic, uh, Canadian, uh, Canada's increasing orientation toward the West, and the country's turn uh, away from coal and, and toward electricity uh, and, and oil. So that brings me to my second example, uh, uh, unequal beginnings, uh, differential property growth, or er, property growth, economic growth between Ontario and Quebec. So here are two images, one of Montreal in the top left and one of York as it was known at the time, Take, uh, and these images are date from about 1800. And you can see that Montreal is, is considerably further along the development trajectory as compared with, with York. York at the time had a population, I think, of about 5,000 people, um, uh, and, and Montreal was clearly embedded uh, in, the, in the global order uh, in many ways, largely through the fur trade. By 1935, Toronto had been renamed York. It had been identified as the colonial capital. Uh, originally, they wanted to locate it in, in London, uh, but Toronto won out. Montreal was still larger, about 25,000 people, but in 19, uh, 1835, a few years after my ancestors arrived in southern Ontario, the population was about 10,000 people. And we see the uh, population growth of Upper and Lower Canada uh, 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 taking different trajectories during this period of time. So until 1827, which corresponds more or less with the end of the lowland clearances uh, in Scotland, I think that ended around 1830 or so. Is that correct? Yeah, I got that one right, did I? <laughs> oh, good. I, I, I had a dream the other night. It was an anxiety dream, and it, 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 it concerned a fact. <laughs> anyway, I tell you I'm taking this seriously, I suppose. Eh? So after, tw 19, after 1827, the population of Upper Canada um, uh, starts to grow, grow at, a, at a much faster rate. Of course, this is part of the British colonial policy to numerically overwhelm the French-speaking uh, colonists in British North America and also to uh, deal with the excess labour and population that uh, was no longer needed in, in industrialising uh, Britain. Now, uh, the percentage of population that live in urban areas, so areas that are a thousand people or more, is often used by, uh, by economists and geographers as, as a way to, to measure economic development. And as you can see, until about 1870, the percentage of the population in both Ontario and Quebec living in urban places is about the same. And then they start to move apart after 1870. This also shows the... That didn't show up very well. Oh, it's just maybe the, the lights in my eye. Um, uh, the, the, this this uh, figure is going to take a bit of explaining. 
So what we have is we have information on uh, urban structure for Quebec and Ontario at three points in time, 1850, 1860, and 1870. The bottom uh, uh, layer, the blue, are cities 25,000 or over. The middle layer is 5,000 to 25,000, and the bo and the and the top layer, the gray, is 1,000 to 5,000 people. The urban structure of Ontario and Quebec were very different. Outside, most of Quebec's population were concentrated in Quebec and Montreal, about 75 percent, and you had to get down to about 30 urban places in Ontario by 1870 to capture 75 percent of its urban population. The uh, population, the landscape outside Quebec and, Mon and Quebec City and Montreal was largely rural and, and agrarian. The landscape outside uh, the largest centres, Toronto, um, uh, was peppered with uh, small, relatively small uh, urban places. Now, this is another table that's going to require some e explanation. So what we have here is value added. So this is value that you add to a commodity as a result of the manufacturing process. So you have the value of the raw material coming into the processing facility or the f whatever it happens to be, and then you have the product coming out at the end. The difference is what we call added value. And you can see that the added value across all those added value categories in Ontario is considerably higher than it was in Quebec. Part of the reason for this is that much of the added value came from commodities that were of higher quality in Ontario, largely because of the geography of Ontario versus Quebec. Uh, I'm going to skip over this one, um, but I do like this one. I wrote this in September of 1983. Uh, and Rather than do it again for a course, I just did a PDF of it, and I still use it in my class. I remember exactly the desk I was sitting at when I wrote, when I wrote this up. <laughs> now, the amount of wealth accumulated in southern Ontario during the 19th century was, was actually quite remarkable. This picture was taken about 1900. These are my ancestors. The man in the middle holding the book, looking all studious, is my great-grandfather. Next to uh, him uh, holding a child is my great-grandmother and there are their ten children, um, including my, my, my grandfather. My great-great-grandfather arrived in Canada in the late 1800s. He tried to farm in the upper Ottawa Valley. It was not a very good agricultural uh, area. He moved down, and he and his brother bought adjoining lots in what is now the city of Vaughan, um, uh, just on the northern outskirts of, of Toronto, and farmed there for almost uh, 100 years. In one generation, they accumulated enough capital to go from a sod home to a log home to a brick home in the Queen Anne style. Uh, there, I think I, there we go. That's, uh, and of course, with Scottish heritage, eh? That's Lockwood, which is a, an old Johnston Castle in southern Scotland. Um, so that's what they named it. Uh, I guess they put on airs. Um, this is taken about 1935, and this is a pretty remarkable uh, building to have been finished in the late 1800s. The, um, the, the brick actually came from Milton, Ontario, which is kind of interesting because my, 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 my grandfather married the daughter of a brick, ma brick, brick maker. So. Oh well. Now, many of the conventional explanations paid little attention, and these are explanations that I, was I, was, I learned about when I was a uh, uh, a history student in uh, elementary and in high school. Um, back in the province east of here that I came from, we started taking history and geography as separate subjects in grade six, and I took history and geography as separate subjects all the way until grade 13, so that'll tell you what that province was. Uh, many of the conventional explanations paid little attention to geographic circumstances and were grounded, often grounded in the view that the bulk of the French Canadian population was unprogressive, overly conservative, and that Montreal's economic and political class were anti-industrial. Whereas the in English speaking colonists, so my ancestors, uh, were regarded as most enterprising and the embodiment of the Protestant work ethic. 
These ideas were written in Lord Durham's report, written in, 19, in 1839. He was commissioned to write a report uh, following the rebellions in Upper and Lower Canada in 1837. Um, Lord Durham was a, in many ways a radical, but he was also a cultural, uh, 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 yeah, he, he believed in cultural superiority. Now, a book written uh, by this gentleman that came from his PhD thesis at McGill University, he wrote this when he was the, he was a member uh, of the economics department at SFU. This is John McCollum who went on to be the chief uh, uh, economist, I believe, for the Royal Bank of Canada, and then went into uh, federal, federal politics. McCollum, in this book, Unequal Beginnings, and this is where I stole the idea from, uh, entered, uh, he, uh, he, he presents a much more geographically inspired uh, explanation that is not grounded in notions of cultural superiority. So one of the things that um, uh, McCollum pointed to was were the superior conditions for agricultural production in southern Ontario as compared to southern Quebec. So here we have two maps. Um, these, these maps are, uh, show the growing season, and using a standard choropleth mapping technique, the longest growing season is in the darkest shade. And so you can see in peninsular southern Ontario, uh, which if you turn your head sideways, you can see looks a bit like an elephant. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the length of the growing season was 170 days um, uh, or, or more. And you can see that in southern Quebec, it didn't even come close to that. During the height of the wheat boom in southern Ontario, there was a higher percentage of farmland devoted to wheat than at any time in Saskatchewan's history. That's just how port important. Um, Ontario farmers, such as my ancestors, also enjoyed a locational advantage. So here's a map of the Great Lakes uh, Basin. A and um, I, I can't, I, I don't think I can use, oh, I can, I can use the clicker, the pointer. Oh, I, so uh, south of the Great Lakes, we have the industrializing cities of the upper Midwest in the United States. So we have uh, Rochester in New, York, in New York State. We have Buffalo, Erie, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Detroit, Toledo. Um, obviously, uh, in Chicago, uh, Gary, Indiana, and then down further, um, uh, we have Columbus, Ohio, and into Pennsylvania. So Ontario farmers enjoyed a locational advantage. Ontario farmers also um, uh, saw the friction of distance reduced. Now, the friction of distance is something that we talk about in spatial analysis and geography, and that's the cost of moving any phenomenon from one place to another, the greater the distance between places, the more costly uh, it's going to be. And you can reduce the friction of distance with transportation technology. So in uh, 1825, the Erie Canal joined um, the, with the Hudson River and gave uh, farmers in southern Ontario access to uh, New York City and to the eastern seaboard. Then a, a couple of years later, in, 19, in 1829, uh, the uh, Welland Canal opened, and this joined Lake Erie with Lake Ontario. So the friction of distance was much reduced for Ontario agricultural produce as a result of these two transportation infrastructure uh, projects. So this kind of sums up McCollum's argument. Uh, Ontario enjoyed both absolute and relative advantages over Quebec, and as a result of that was able to grow at a faster rate than Quebec did and over, in fact, overtake Quebec. So the absolute advantages come from things like better soils and longer growing seasons. The relative advantages, uh, many of them focus around proximity of location and reduction of the friction of distance. So this is a slide my wife told me to put in. And I, think it's the, I think it's the best one of the lot, you can tell me. Because when I, when I went through this with her, she said, you know, it's just kind of flat in the middle. Eh? You gotta put something in to keep people awake. <laughs> and not a joke, because she doesn't like my jokes much. <laughs> so when I think about these two examples, I think about four things. I think these are really, really important. These are, I, think, I think these are important takeaway points. First, they, they underscore the importance of critically thinking about matters, especially 
in the context of what I call uh, conventionally held wisdoms uh, or ideas and conditioned thinking. Conditioned thinking. Those are ideas that we hold because they were passed on to us by authority figures, including, you know, drunk Uncle Charlie at Thanksgiving um, or bigoted Aunt Marge. Uh, second, the outcomes such as I've discussed here cannot be understood without reference to broad forces and mechanisms. We are not uh, islands uh, in and of ourselves. Oftentimes those broad, broad scale forces and factors are very difficult to comprehend and require some serious uh, thought about them. Third, um, I know that uh, the historians will like this, history has important lessons for us. Thus it is important to cultivate and nurture historical literacy. If anyone would like to explore this further, I'm sure some of the historians would have some thoughts on it later. And finally, geographic circumstances matter. Um, and an examination of those circumstances, so looking at questions through a geographic lens, using geographic uh, reasoning and theory uh, and facts, gives us yet one more tool in our critical thinking toolbox as we challenge conventional wisdom and um, reveal and... Um, uh, and condition thinking, that's it. All right, I'm on the homeward stretch. So we've just completed the signature hole on my friend Lance's favorite disc golf course, and we're heading for home. My final example, I want to turn to the question of food insecurity, so I shouldn't be flippant about it. Now, food insecurity is defined by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, you know, that body that the fellow down south doesn't like much, uh, it exists when all people, at all times, have both physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets not only their dietary needs, but also their food preferences. And that's an interesting development because the, foods, the concept of food security didn't always include food preferences, but this is important uh, from, a, from a cultural perspective. Uh, so that people can lead an active and healthy life. Now, food security and food insecurity, which is the absence of food security, uh, is a global problem. But I want to focus on the problem a little bit more, a little closer to home. So here we have some data from a research group from the University of Toronto. And as you can see, in 2011, 2012, it was estimated that 1.6 million households experienced some level of food insecurity. Marginal food insecurity is defined as when household members worry about not having enough money for food. At the most severe uh, point, uh, severe food insecurity is when, because of insufficient money, meals are missed or food intake is reduced. And moderate food insecurity is when compromises are made relative to the quality of food or the quantity of food purchased due to a lack of money. Now, in many other parts of the world, uh, economic circumstances are only one of a number of factors contributing to food insecurity, but here in Canada, it's largely, um, largely related to income. So, we know that food insecurity is a function of income. We know that the food insecurity is uh, greatest amongst people in the lower socioeconomic ranks. But when we look at food insecurity geographically, looking at through that, through that spatial lens that we geographers like to use, we see that food insecurity is geographically variable across the country. It is, it is greatest in Nunavut, followed by NWT, and then in, a, in Atlantic Canada. These are also regions with um, uh, chronically low in, uh, incomes and high rates uh, of unemployment. We know that in northern Canada, north of 60 degrees, that food insecurity is greatest amongst the region's indigenous population. This is a function of at least two intersecting factors. First, many indigenous Canadians in the north live in small, geographically isolated communities where food costs are exorbitantly high. This is then combined with the fact that incomes amongst the region's indigenous population are low and unemployment rates are high. And if anyone uh, questions whether or not food prices 
are exorbitantly high in the Canadian North, north of 60. This is what it would have cost you uh, for a four liter jug of 2% milk in Nunavut in de on December 8th, 2014. $10.39 with the Northern subsidy. Without the Northern subsidy, it was $20.91. Now, in Southern Ontario, where most of us live, and most Canadians live in either the, uh, I think it's green and pink, I can't really, orange, orange and pink. Uh, about 99% of Canadians live in the most densely and moderately, we, we live in the moderately populated part by density, part of the country, about 99%. We know that there are two groups that are at particular risk for food insecurity. The first group, are the rural elderly. And this is a shot taken from uh, uh, southern Saskatchewan a few years ago. Uh, and you can see closed up shops. You can see elderly people going down to the cafe uh, for coffee in the morning on their scooters and on their golf carts and, um, um, and so on. Now, the reason that the rural elderly are in such dire straits when it comes to food insecurity is because of a pr largely because of a process known as agricultural industrialization. Agriculture started to industrialize globally in the late, 19, late 1920s and the Soviet Union first. It really picked up steam here in North America and Western Europe after World War II. So here we have data on census farm numbers in Western Canada between 1971 and 2016. And you can see we've got a, a, a pretty, pretty, steady, pretty steady drop. Fewer farmers means fewer, fewer farms means fewer farmers. But we still have almost as much land in production. So the average size of farm, which means that there's greater distance between farms, lower densities, has climbed really sharply. These data are for Canada as a whole. In 1921, uh, the average farm size in Canada was 128 acres, or 198 acres, sorry. By 2016, it was 820 acres. Interestingly, the most rapid rate of change took place after 1950, and the most rapid rate of change took place in, get this, PEI and Alberta. The conditions for the industrialization of agriculture were more favorable in those two geographic areas. Um, and obviously, uh, the conditions were more attractive for large blocks of capital that were engaging in that industrialization process. There's a bit of neo-Marxism for you. Now, the second group that are particularly vulnerable are the urban poor. Now, this group typically lives in a zone that we geographers and planners as well uh, uh, call zones of transition. Uh, these are transition zones. They're zones of mixed land use, uh, typically found between the central business district or the downtown core um, and more affluent suburban uh, neighborhoods. Now, here's a, a map that was done as part of an exercise in one of my classes a few years ago. Um, this is looking at the concept of food deserts in Lethbridge. One of the reasons that... Um, the urban poor are uh, particularly vulnerable is because most of them live in what we call urban deserts and they don't have the financial capacity to overcome that geographic isolation. My wife and I live in an urban desert. Many people here probably live in a, in a, in a food desert, um, but we uh, often, I'm, I'm sure many, most of us here will have the in income uh, uh, that allows us to overcome that, that barrier. I, does anyone really think about, you know, how much it costs you to get in a car to go and do your grocery shopping? If you're doing that by transit or you're um, uh, ordering a cab, then the money you spend on the cab doesn't get spent on food for your family. So a food desert can be defined, and this is according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, as an area lacking access to, aff to affordable fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low-fat milk, and other foods that make up a healthy and, and full diet. So what we have here on this map, the dots represent major retail grocery chains. 
storage. Okay, I'm almost done. The circles around represent the walking distance for an average healthy person. Everything outside that light circle is by definition a food desert. Now, we've also categorized the census tracts according to income. The darkest census tracts have the lowest income, and the lighter census tracts have relatively higher income. So in the higher income census tracts, the ones that are lighter, uh, lighter shaded, uh, by and large, the households in general are going to be at lower risk for food insecurity. In the darker uh, uh, shaded areas, the households are going to be at greater risk for food insecurity. Now, if you don't think this matters, look at this. A representative basket of food, and we put this together for undergraduate students, so we included some healthy stuff you know, some fruits and vegetables, but we also included hot dogs and craft dinner and peanut butter and, and so on. If you were to shop at a major chain grocery store, it would cost you $83. If you would, were to shop at a non-chain grocery store or at a convenience store, it would cost you $101. Most of the food deserts in the city are located proximate, uh, uh, relatively close to convenience stores and non-chain grocery stores. In addition, many of, the, many of the darkest areas are actually what we call food swamps. We actually, we're located in a food swamp right now. We used to have a grocery store across the street. It was one of the anchors along with, the, with Woodward's and the, where the bay is now. We had the IGA downtown where, where CASA is. But count the number of fast food outlets and convenience stores in this area. Similarly, at the, uh, on the west side near the university, where we used to have Super Sam's, uh, Super Sam's closed down. It was replaced by uh, another, another store offering some food items. Uh, but think about the number of fast food outlets just in that one mall and in the vicinity. Those are called food swamps. So if you live in a food desert, such as London Road, and you are a woman leading a lone, uh, a lone woman leading a household, your median income is less than $30,000 a year. The median family income for, for, uh, the, for Alberta was nearly $75,000 a year for that same year. So the capacity of that population to overcome its locational disadvantage is much impaired. So why does this happen? So this is, you know, this is the what was where, what, what, why. Well, supermarkets are in business to make money. Uh, and that's as it should be in a, in, a, in a capitalist society. But as middle class and upper middle class households have moved to the suburbs, and the planners know this, um, so too have the, uh, uh, have the uh, supermarkets. So this shows London, Ontario, 1961, and you can see the concentration of supermarkets downtown and the concentration of supermarkets in uh, the next state, which is 2005, are all out on the suburbs. Have, they've vacated the downtown, they've vacated the downtown core. And as I say, in a capitalist society, a capitalist economy, this is how it should be. Uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't expect capitalist firms to take, it, to take a hit. That's why we have taxes and wealth transfer systems and so on. So what can be done? Oh, there's, oh, in case you don't know where London is. <laughs> there we go. Uh, what can be done? Now, I certainly don't pretend to have all the answers, and, and in fact, I have probably more questions uh, than I have answers. But I think somehow, as a body politic, we need to find ways of changing the quality of the food supply, particularly the quality of the food supply made available to our most vulnerable uh, populations. I regard this as a matter of uh, moral responsibility, other people may regard it as a matter of financial responsibility. It will involve uh, all three uh, levels of government and a wide range uh, of, of stakeholders. Just want to check my time here. Am I doing okay on time? Yes or no? I'm getting tight. Okay. When I think about what we could do, I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking about the old Fram commercial, right? It's where the guy's working on the blown engine and he can say, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. 
And if we don't address the issue of food insecurity, we're going to be paying later. So here we have uh, diabetes uh, um, uh, diagnoses between, uh, between 1998, 1999, and 2008-2009, increased from 3.6% of the Canadian population to 7.0% of the population. And if you think that that's trivial or doesn't matter, the average diabetes patient will cost over a five-year period $16,000 to the healthcare system. The average healthy person is $6,000, $10,000 less. So this is one thing that I do know. Where one lives and one's personal geography affects food choices that are available, and food choices affects people's lives in all kinds of ways. We know this from lots and lots of research. Now that brings me to the end of my talk, uh, except for one more slide. Uh, but I think this, this may help you understand what I've been trying to do. These are the three types of questions that we ask in geography. We ask, what is where? So what's a ge where? And we map that. That's the most simple form of geography. That's descriptive. You know, monkeys can do that. Uh, and then we ask, why is it there? So these are the processes and the mechanisms responsible for why, why things are there. And then the third question we ask is, well, you know, why do we care? So I'm going to close now. But before I do, I'd like to thank uh, Dean Craig Cooper for extending the invitation. I'd like to thank uh, my minder over here, Catherine Reeder, uh, the organizer of these talks and many others. She's done a fantastic job for the Faculty of Arts and Science. I'd obviously like to thank members of the audience for your interest and your support. And finally, if anybody has any lingering doubts that geography or location matters, I just want you to reflect on this last slide. <laughs>